Uh, we want to welcome you to the Octagon Chapel and to this service that's all about play. Whether it's your first time here or you're a regular, you are really welcome. If you're regularly irregular, you are very welcome. If you sometimes don't make it because you have a lie-in, you are very welcome. If you sometimes go elsewhere, you are very welcome. If you're feeling playful, you are welcome. And if you're not feeling playful, you are also welcome. We live in a very serious time, so serious that it feels hard to listen to the news at times. So why have a service about play? Because amidst all the fighting and arguing and famine and tragedy and the frightening changing pace of technology, people are basically the same and people need to play. Everyone, not just kids, although they are very good at it. Jesus is reported to have said, to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must be like a child. Today we're going to take some time to consider what that means. You may have come here full of the woes of the world, or with personal sorrows too deep to let go of. And today may seem a slight jolt against what you are feeling inside, but we invite you to be open and maybe a little playful to the service. In putting together this service, we've used scripture, research about play, song lyrics, and our own experiences to help us explore how play might be important for us as spiritual beings. We hope that you will find something of value that will make you think, and we hope you may even enjoy yourself today. In this chapel, we open up the service lighting a chalice. And I wonder, we've got a whole flock of children over there, and we're going to invite them up for the children's story. So would everyone like to come up to the front, and then would someone help me with the chalice lighting? That would be great. The three regulars, lovely. Would you like that old one? We light this chalice with a living flame. The flame is held at its base by the wick, while at the same time it dances and moves with the air. It's unpredictable in its movement and shape, and it flickers and dances and constantly changes. And I'm going to hand over to Saint now. This story is brand new, and it's called Wide with Wonder. Tucked away in a room sits a girl studying a book. Her name is Jeanette, and she is a very clever girl. Her mind is full of maths and science, impossibly long words, and clever facts that lead to more questions than to answers. Mommy, did you know that the word bit is short for binary digit? Her mother looks up from her knitting to smile and exclaims her fascination. That is so wonderful you know such a thing, my love. But what is a binary digit? Jeanette says, it's like a, it's like a stitch in, in computer language. And her mother looks at the stitches in her scarf that she's knitting, looking for a binary digit. That's not what I mean, Mommy. Never mind. It's too complicated to explain it to you. Her parents don't understand what their darling daughter is talking about most of the time, but they are very proud of her and brag about how she will be a scientist or a doctor when she grows up. Her teachers are also very proud of her and give her badges and awards. Jeanette's grandparents give her toys as reward. She is polite and grateful, but the toys stay on the shelf because her nose is buried in a book. Such a good girl, so clever, her grandmother says but all that reading and no place put a frown on the poor girl's face. 
Jeanette is frowning, but she is frowning in thought. Her forehead scrunches and her eyes squint as she sits at her desk in her room with her pencils and rulers, puzzling over puzzles that puzzle the world. Jeanette's grandmother comes over to visit and has decided it's time Jeanette goes outside and explores the world instead of measuring it in books. Go out and play, young lady. It is a beautiful day. Jeanette sneaks out a book under her arm and trudges outside to find a place to read in peace. Outside, there is a boy named Habibi running in a field. He chases butterflies. He climbs trees. He dreams of flying a rocket ship and climbing the highest mountains. He doesn't have time for books and math because it won't help him uh, figure out how to leap from one rooftop to the next in a single bound, which is his favorite thing to do. Though it pours his mother to tears who yells out at him, Habibi, Habibi, you get down. Go do your homework to find yourself before you find yourself fall into the ground. He doesn't see the point. How can he do all this writing and thinking when his dreams demand him to live an adventurous life? On the same day that Jeanette is sent outside by her grandmother, Habibi is trying to find, uh, fly his new kite, but he just can't get it to take flight. He has no interest in reading how to fly a kite, so he just keeps running and throwing it up in the air, hoping it will fly. He's been running and dragging that kite along the ground most of the afternoon. Habibi is so focused on flying his poor ragged kite and Jeanette's nose is so deeply buried in her book as she walks across the same field that the two crash into each other. Oh no, they both cried as they are sprawled on the ground. Jeanette picks up the kite and Habibi picks up Jeanette's book. There is a picture of a glider on the book and Habibi asks, what is the big word on the cover? Aerodynamics, says Jeanette. What does that mean, says Habibi, asks Habibi. Uh, aerodynamics, it's how air moves around things. Rules of aerodynamics explain how airplane is able to fly, Jeanette replies as she thoughtfully examines his broken kite. Aerodynamics, Habibi slows out, slowly sounds out the word. Can you use that to make my kite fly? Jeanette can indeed make Habibi's kite fly and teaches him how. Next thing you know, they are both running in the field and talking about the science of flight while the kite soars high in the air. Later that week, Habibi was riding his bike when a car went by with black smoke coming out of its exhaust. It stank and made Habibi cough. He thought how much better it would be for cars to have bubbles coming out of the exhaust pipe instead of smog and pollution. He rode his bike fast to Jeanette and asked if she had any books that could make this happen. Jeanette frowned and thought, like she does when she's doing some serious thinking. She pulled out her books on chemistry and mechanics. They drew up some plans together and borrowed some tools from the garage. After some careful adjustments to her mother's car, they waited in hiding to watch what happened when she drove away to the shop that afternoon. The neighbors stopped and stared in bewilderment as the car spewed a trail of bubbles down the street. Her baby and Jeanette laughed with delight and imagined the motorways filled with bubbles. As they grew up together, their friendship grew um, as they made and played with all sorts of inventions and studied together. They won awards in science fairs and kite flying competitions. Jeanette's parents and teachers were even prouder of her because her clever studies were now brought to life in fun, fun and practical ways. Her grandmother was the happiest of them all, as Jeanette had learned to play and make all sorts of friends, though Habibi would always be her best friend. Habibi's mother was proud that her son took to his studies and his marks greatly improved. She was mostly relieved that he wasn't jumping from rooftop to rooftop much anymore. One day he, uh, until one day he came home speaking of plans of inventing a super cape that would fly him to the moon. <laughs> oh, my dear boy, she cried, can't you invent something that keeps your feet safely on the ground? Jeanette and Habibi, uh, Habibi went to the same uni together and when they graduated, they opened their own invention research and development laboratory. They named it Wide with Wonder. Though they worked on many wonderful inventions, kite flying was still their passion, and of all the new words Habibi had learned in his studies, his favorite word would always be aerodynamics. The end. So the children aren't gonna now leave us, but they'll be helping us a bit later. Prepare yourselves for that. And now we're gonna have Helen come up to do a lovely reading. So this is a reading 
from a book called Day of Piglet by Benjamin Hoff. Just let them turn on. I have actually bought the book in, so if anybody wants to have a look at it a bit later, they might also know The Tao of Pooh, which is both by the same author. I can't we it's a bit small. <laughs> oh, put those there. When you observe the natural world, you'll eventually see that everything in it is designed to succeed, including what some might judge to be bad. If you learn the natural world's principles of success, you'll see things not as good or bad, but as they are. On returning from a walk about 40 years ago, the Swiss engineer George de Maestral found cockburs clinging to his clothing. Unlike countless other people who have cursed the prickly seed pods, picked them off and discarded them, he asked himself, why do they stick? Examining them closely, he found that they were covered in tiny hooks, which had become embedded in the loops of his clothing fabric. He wondered if it would be possible to develop fasteners based on a hook and loop principle. From his watching and wondering came Velcro from velvet crochet or velvet hook. Fastening systems made from which are used all over the world. So despite the tired old, the tired old claim that necessity is the mother of invention, it's usually observation and imagination that deserve the credit. The major portion of useful inventions, knowledge and achievement has been brought about by curious, childlike observers of the world around them, whose vision is unclouded by judgments of what is possible or impossible or good or bad. The telescope, for example, was invented in principle by some Dutch children playing with defective lenses discarded from the shop of a spectacles maker. They found that when the lenses were held one in front of the other, which of course everyone knew was not supposed to be done, distant objects appeared closer. News of the discovery spread to Italy and to the eager attention of a man named Galileo. We now have the address by Saint. When I was a child, I dreamed like a child of wonder, with my back in the grass, my eyes to the sky to see. I believed in the stars, and I knew they cast a spell that I was under. With my fingers in the dirt, I was a part of the earth. Every living thing was a part of me. But it's gone. It's gone. I can't feel it. So go the lyrics of Grammy Award-winning American singer-songwriter Melissa Etheridge from her 1989 album, Brave and Crazy. It is clear from her other songs that Melissa did find that child-like uh, sense of wonder again, but that is not always the case for those who have let adult responsibilities and worries forsake their connection with play. Some would say that is sad, where others would say it is a part of becoming an adult. But a growing number of psychologists and sociologists are citing play deprivation as being particularly detrimental to children, as well as the stifling, as well as stifling to the well-being of adults. Brian Sutton Smith, with a PhD in education and a distinguished expert on play, asserts that the opposite of play is not work; it is depression. Play is no laughing matter for another uh, such researcher on play, Dr. Stuart Brown, who founded the National Institute of Play located in Carmel, California, to offer programs and resources that can bring the transformative power of play to all segments of society. On this institute's website, Plato is quoted as saying, you can discover more about a person in one hour of play than a year of conversation. Dr. Stuart Brown, trained in medicine and psychiatry, first observed the importance of play by noting its absence in the childhoods of a group of young, carefully studied homicidal men. 
Clay deprivation does not commonly lead to such drastic acts, but its impact holds a negative developmental impact that can last a lifetime. In his essay, Consequences of Play Deprivation, Brown explains, the urge to play is embedded within all humans and has been generated and refined by nature for over one million years. With the flood of information from many disciplines, it is now possible to, spe to specify and integrate many of play behavior's contributions to overall human development and long-term survival. Where tradition has often relegated play as a non-essential or at least a very elective uh, human luxury, that general cultural misperception uh, is no longer viable. Sustained, moderate to severe play deprivation, particularly in the first 10 years of life, appeared, to, uh, appeared linked to major uh, varied but virtually omnipresent uh, emotional dysregulation, increased uh, prevalence of depression, a tendency to become mired in rigid, inflexible perceptions of options uh, available for adaptation, diminished impulse control, less self-regulation, increased uh, addiction predilection, diminished management of aggression, and fragility and, shall and shallowness of enduring interpersonal relationships. Now those dire symptoms of play deprivation are daunting and depressing to list, but I felt it important to share this, lest there are any doubts that play is serious business. In his essay, Brown notes some benefits of play, such as self-regulation, curiosity, increased perseverance, uh, progressive mastery, and optimism. In Dr. Uh, Brown's TED Talk, Play is More Than Just fun, fun, he shared his belief that remembering the first toy that inspired and impassioned you as a child could lead you to a new career path or a sea change in life. I fancied the idea of doing a meditation for you today that led to back to that memory. But when I read this, uh, ran this idea by a few people, it turns out that it was more of a painful reminder that they too experienced some level of play deprivation. However mild that deprivation may be, it is still upsetting to remember. So our meditation will be more playful and less, shall we say, triggering. This is a service about play, so we're going to lighten things up. But if you do dare to hearken back to your first favorite toy memory later, I suggest you allow a memory that is purely your passion and untainted by any undesirable interference of others. Invite a memory that is full of possibilities and excitement. Leave it at that, own it, let it grow unfettered. Now let us focus on the benefits of play and prioritizing play in our lives. Make that a choice. You can do that, and it is a good choice to make. There are light-hearted ways of approaching a childhood bereft of play. When I was 37, someone close to me threw a transformative birthday party for me. She knew that my childhood uh, was deprived in many respects and that my birthdays were quite paltry. Each person at this birthday party gave me a gift that was appropriate to the assigned age they were given, anywhere between 1 and 13 years. The person given the age of one for me, and for, uh, given the age of one, for instance, gave me Mr. McQuackers, whom I've kept with me all this time. <laughs> with each present, I imagine. <laughs> with each present. <laughs> I imagined how it would feel to be me on that day for that uh, age, hoping it would finally be treated as my special day, despite previous disappointment. I opened the present with the innocence and joy that I might have felt at that age. It was the bestest birthday ever. I got an Etch-a-Sketch Etch Lego, uh, 24 different colors of uh, Play-Doh, uh, and I didn't even know they made that many different colors in play now, quite frankly, but I had all 24 I did. And uh, that's just to name a few. Uh, just imagine a room full of adults, adults crawling on the floor and coloring and playing and laughing with puppets. It was brilliant and deeply healing for all. As George Bernard Shaw famously said, we don't stop playing because we grow old. We grow old because we stop playing. So what else can you do to uh, bring play back in your life? You might think to play board games or sports, but what about some unstructured random acts of fun? For instance. 
a couple of my favorite uh, playful memories. Uh, walking along a canal wharf in London on Valentine's Day, newly single, no tree. Um, but I had uh, found a bottle of uh, bubbles in my pocket, because that happens for me. And I just blew the bubbles as I was walking down, and I remember passerbys smiling and a few adults reaching out to grab the bubbles. So uh, my dear partner Helen here, she uh, bought a, a parrot puppet for work in the group therapy that she runs as a prop to explain how our thoughts can be unhelpful to us. She brought it, she brought it with us on a, uh, on a day, uh, one day on a car ride. For research purposes, I'm sure, yeah. Uh, she held Liddy the parrot out the window and laughed with such joy at the sight of the wind over his furry feathers. And Yes. He loved it. Oh, you should have seen him. It's like when a dog puts his head out the window. He's just like, ah. It was delightful, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Yes, yeah, say hi to everyone, Libby. Um, Helen honked as big at passerbys making children and dogs laugh and smile. Yeah. Yeah, you remember that, don't you? It was good. Um, today, we hope to encourage you to do something spontaneous and silly. See how many people. Okay, look at that. <laughs> See how many people you can make smile and send your warmest blessings to those who have forgotten how to play or lost the courage to be silly sober. You haven't lost that courage, have you, Libby? No. And above all, put your back to the grass with your eyes to the stars to see. This, <laughs> with your eyes to the stars to see. Put your fingers in the dirt and remember you are part of the earth and every living thing. Two out of two, furry, furry to gray. Play is where it's at. Right, Libby? Yay! <laughs> and now, though it seems unlikely, likely, it is now time for some guided reflection. Have a duck. Okay. So I invite you to lean back and close your eyes. Get yourself settled and comfortable. Now let us focus on some deep, gentle breaths. And upon exhale, let your shoulders relax and body settle comfortably into your seat. Let your mind settle. So at ease, so at peace. Inhale and exhale. That's right. There is nothing for you to say or think or do in this time. Give yourself permission to let your mind and body rest into a receptive state as I offer you words and images to reflect upon. Let any busyness of your mind settle like apple blossoms sinking to the ground after the wind has settled. A nice, Gentle, deep breath again, and upon the exhale, let your mind be clear and open to a gentle and delightful scene. You find yourself on a sunny beach. This is your individual vision, so you can have the beach any way you like, seagulls or no seagulls. Warm sand between your toes, or safely sitting on a big, cozy beach towel. However you wish it to happen, let yourself take in the warmth of this sunny day. Listen to the lulling waves washed ashore. So it is, so it is. Let yourself look up in the sky and watch any wispy clouds that might pass by. Then notice a kite aloft in the air. Watch it sway and dance back and forth. Notice the color and style of the kite. As the breeze dies down, watch the kite slowly sink toward the ground. Let your eyes follow it as it sinks lower and lower. Watch as it settles in the sand, in stillness and rest. Then movement catches your eye, and you see a dog running after a stick. He 
get jumps in the water with a big doggy smile and comes running back to its owner, dropping the stick with a hearty wet shake of its body. See the owner laugh while turning away from the drenching spray of the dog's shaking and then pets the dog and throws the stick again with a joyous smile. Let yourself feel the merriment, freedom, exhilaration, and connection these two share. Breathe in the salty scent in the air and let the sense of easy play sink you deeper into this relaxed scene. You hear laughter nearby and some children are building a sandcastle. There is such innocence and wonder in their play. Let yourself invent a perfect childhood moment building such a sandcastle without worry or construction to the magical imaginings of what is or what could be. Are there tunnels or a moat to your castle? Is there a flag? Do you shape it with a stick or a shovel? Enjoy what it feels like to run with the imagination and play of a child. This is your visualization of a perfect day, full of contented play on a holiday that whisks you away from any worry. Let yourself feel the delight and relaxation you've been guided to experience. Notice how your body, breath, heart, and mind responds to the speech holiday reflection. It's okay to enjoy such a break. Breathe it in. That's right. Now let yourself continue to soak in this feeling for a few minutes before we gently ease into listening to Nina Simone singing, I wish I knew how it felt to be free. Um, we now have a reading. We were actually going to have a reading from a textbook, but then when we read it through a few times, we couldn't really understand it. It was quite complicated. So we've actually taken something from Wikipedia. So clowns have a sacred role to represent a trickster character in religious ceremonies. Other times, the purpose serves by clowns is only to parody excessive seriousness or to deflate pomposity. In the sense of how clowns function, a clown shows what is wrong with the ordinary way of doing things. A clown shows how to do ordinary things the wrong way. Members of a clown society may dress in a special costume reserved for clowns which is often a ridiculously extreme or improper form of normal dress. Some members paint their body with horizontal black and white stripes, which represent a skeleton. While in their costume, clowns have special permission from their society to parody or criticise defective aspects of their own culture. They are always required to be funny. Other persons living within the same culture may recognise a clown when they see one, but seldom consciously understand what the clowns do for their society. The typical explanation is, he's just a funny man. In the case of the jester at the English royal court, with his cap of bells and pig's bladder stick, he was allowed to make fun of, being delicate and sometimes downright rude to members of the royal family, and their entourage, without fear of reprisal. You can turn this world around and bring back all those happy days. Put your troubles down, it's time to celebrate. Let love shine and we will find a way to come together and make things better. We need a holiday. If we took a holiday, 
took some time to celebrate just one day out of life, it would be, it would be so nice. So saith Madonna in her song, Holiday. We need time off. Time off from work. Time off from worry. Time off from caring. Time off from the rules and regulations of life. Even God had a day off. But then God had made the whole of creation in, the, in six days, or maybe a bit longer. But one of the points that, of the story is that God had a rest day. It's easy to get too caught up in the seriousness and rules of life that we forget to rest. And when Jesus was asked about the Sabbath and what was and wasn't allowed on that day, he reminded them it was a day God had made for humans so that they could relax not a day for us to worry about what we owe to God. We need time to relax, to play, to dream, to be free from constraints. Not all the time, order is important. It can make things predictable, prevent accidents, and allows us to perform complicated actions like resetting the time on the oven. Without structure and rules, things can go badly wrong. But all these constraints can be rather tiresome, especially when our inner nature is to be selfish, unfaithful and aggressive. It's not easy being a human being. If anyone here finds it easy, please speak to me afterwards, I want to know how you do it. Religions understand this and have put in place traditions that help ease the angst of being human. They understand that to constantly be keeping to a set of rules can break our spirit. And so they would allow times of the year when we are permitted to follow our more basic nature. Religions would introduce rules in order for us to be able to live together safely and in community. But then there would also be times when you can break the rules in order to let off steam. In Alan de Botton's book, Religion for Atheists, he describes how in medieval Christianity at New Year, there was a fectum fatorum, also known as the Festival of Fools. During this time, the clergy would play dice on the altar, have drinking competitions in the nave, fart in accompaniment to the Ave Maria, and tie woolen penises to their tunics. I wonder how that would play out with women priests. So this festival was seen as sacred. The idea being behind it was that foolishness was then done for the year. The church at the, t- described, at the time described the festival by saying that people need this in the same way that wine barrels need to be opened and let the air in so that they do not explode. They understood that the human psyche needs some release. All religions have their times of chaos and festivity. The Holi festival in India is marked by singing and dancing and the throwing of coloured powder over each other. And it marks the victory of good over evil and the end of the winter. A number of different countries mark the new year in April and have a festival involving water, water being a symbol for purification and good luck. The celebrations of New Year can involve massive water fights, much the same way as a street snowball as a street snowball fight would. Festivals can help us to mark an important event or transition in the year. A celebration, a celebration of midwinter that predates our modern Christmas would let you feast and meet with family and exchange gifts, and this would be a welcome festival in a dark, cold season with very little light or food. Some celebrations help us to cope with changing times of year, but can also help us with life transitions. A wedding, for example, is a time for celebration, but also marks the end of the freedom of the single life, and may also be a cause of sadness for the parents. The ceremony and the surrounding activities, including the stag do and the honeymoon, all help the couple and the community move through the transition into married life. 
Some of the activity is religious and solemn, followed by a time of drinking and dancing or playing tricks on each other. All religions would have their own rituals to mark important events, and they would have a mixture of solemn and fun, of rules and structure, and then of letting go. Playfulness also has another purpose. In the reading, we heard about the sacred clowns of North America and about English gestures. They are allowed to point out when it is wrong, what is wrong with society, especially if someone in authority is acting in a harmful way, who could imagine? Much the same way as comedians might do now. They also allow us to laugh in difficult times and bring us out of ourselves. Interestingly, it is often not understood what their purpose is, and they're just seen as funny people. In other words, they're just not taken seriously. I would like to end with a more personal note with a couple examples of playfulness in my own life. A modern therapy that I've recently undergone called CBT helps you to look at your rules that you live by and question if they are helpful or if they're still helpful. One of mine was that if you lose something, it's important that you tell yourself off in your head most severely in order to stop yourself doing it again. This, I noticed, did not help me find lost items and also made me rather sad. I am now gentler with my thoughts and more playful in my approach. I lose things just as often, but I find them in a better mood. Last year, I was told by my boss I had five days annual leave that I needed to take in the next six weeks or I would lose it. I booked onto a five-day workshop called Find Your Inner Fool. It took five days. During this time, we learned to, impro to improvise and be playful. I learned to laugh at myself. And more than anything, I learned that I was acceptable just the way I was. I found I am able to have a lighter approach to difficult matters. And it made it easier for me to cope with the email I received on my return, telling me I had taken too much leave and had to work extra days to make up for it. Don't you just love an, a large organisation? And I'm going to end with a quotation by Terry Gillimock. Always jump in the puddles. Always skip alongside the flowers. The only, for, the only fights worth fighting are pillow and food varieties. Now we're going to have a song. Carol is going to, Carol is going to help us and the children are going to help us. And after the song, I would like you to stay standing for the benediction. And there are some actions for this, which we welcome you to join in. You don't have to, but it's more fun if you do. So please stand if you are able for this. This song, just so to give you the heads up, is called Head and Shoulders, Knees and Toes. Nick, thank you. Ready? Head and shoulders, knees and toes, knees and toes. Head and shoulders, knees and toes, knees and toes, and eyes and ears and mouth and nose. Head and shoulders, knees and toes, knees and toes. Now we're going to miss out a word. And shoulders, knees and toes, knees and toes. Now we have two words. Knees and toes, knees and toes. Toes, three words. And toe. And toe. <laughs> is, it, is it right? What is it next? And nose. One last time with all the words. Head and toes. Well done. Please stay standing for the final benediction. I'm not quite sure how we follow that. Uh, that was superb. Well done, Helen. Um, we want to just close this with everyone standing, just for a moment. We have a, a um, um, reading from Rosie Miles, and it's called Here and Now. Through the unexpected wonder of love and life, bursting through my world like an explosion of stars. For the wonder of my person, 
for the people and the journey which brought me to this place, here, now. For hope and wonder and all at the future, at all the adventures the years may contain, for all these things I am so richly blessed. I am brimful of the wonder of God bedding down in me.